All right. There we go. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, happy Good y'all are asleep. So let's wake y'all up with uh, Love Lifted Me 173. Stand with us. <laughs> Oh, okay, sure. Oh, what are we going to do? Don't you worry about it. Oh. It's on me. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deep in sin within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me no sin. seated.
Everything's getting ready to <coughs> actually, or is it uh, Bob's, Bob's, going to go. Bob's going to say. I keep making the same mistake over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I don't want you to like sing, brother. It's not that I don't find the words, he might be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> saying was the old southern saying you know that uh well bless their hearts uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that means there's no hope for them <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, there's only one verse there, so we can get home in time for the Super Bowl. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is um, going along with all of the parables. This is the next one on the list. And this one, like last week's, really surprised me um, just with how much was in that short little verse. Um, but it's Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. We're going to be going to other places, as you see probably in your outline. I've got other passages that we're going to be visiting um but it's just matthew 13 44 and actually the hilarious thing is and this is why you should be i think um here for sunday school um uh, pastor kind of teed me up perfectly this morning uh with what we were talking about and i think as we go on you're going to see why um but it's important to be here uh for sunday school it's a really good lesson and we're going through genesis so uh, be here for that if you can but matthew 13 44 says again the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure, hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, 
and buyeth that field. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I thank you, Lord, for all that we've seen, all that we have heard so far today. And God, I just pray now as we break open your word, God, that you would bless me, Lord, that you would, God, help me first and foremost. And God, may the word go forth from this place, God, and may you, uh, everything that is said and done be for your honor and glory. God, we love you. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So today's parable is kind of interesting because to understand the parable um, is really to understand why man was created, something Pastor touched on this morning in Sunday school. You know, to understand it, one of the things that we have to go to is go back to our creation, go back to Genesis chapter 1. Or actually, in this case, Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be in chapter 1 here in a minute. But Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 tells us, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You know, if you notice all through the account of creation, whether you're in Genesis 1 or Genesis 2, one thing that you'll notice is this. Everything that God creates, he speaks. Except for one thing which is mankind. Everything from the stars to the plants to the animals, God spake and they existed. But with man, he said, no, we're going to form him. And I'm going to breathe into him. Different, right? Completely different than anything that had come before. And the reason why that is is because he made us for a specific reason. He made us different than the animals. That's why I don't get why people insist on this evolution business where, you know, they say that we evolved from monkeys or from whatever because we're completely different. Not only were, are we different, yeah, we might have some similarities to, to different animals, but that doesn't mean anything because we were made, created <clears throat> differently than everything else that exists. And in Genesis 1.26, it says, And God said... Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, I could spend probably an hour talking about that verse alone, but I want to touch on a couple of things. Number one, he says, let us make man in our image. Now, there is some, just people have, uh, I guess, not really nailed down, or I guess there's different schools of thought as to what this is, our image. Number one is that we were made unique. If you notice, humanity was made uniquely. It's not, we're not like anything else, like I just said. We are different, created differently, and we look differently from everything else. I know some of us might look better than others, but, you know, that's <laughs> up to God. Um, but we were made with a specific purpose that is there in Genesis 1.26, which is... Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. We were molded for a special relationship that the animals don't have, that the trees don't have, I'm sorry, um, that nothing else on this planet has except for us, and that is to have a relationship with God. As Pastor said this morning, God walked with Adam Probably daily in the cool of the day, he did not walk with the animals daily, did not walk with the plants daily. He walked with us daily in a special bond, a special relationship that nothing else in creation enjoys but us. And one commentary put it this way about our relationship and our creation, and I agree to it with some extent, but I wanted to to put it here because I think it's got a lot of truth in it. It says, God made us with an eternal side to ourselves. You know, all dogs do not go to heaven, as as the saying says. But we do. We have an eternal soul that lives on and persists beyond the mortal flesh that we have. Not only do we have that, but God also made us to have dominion over the rest of creation. And lastly, God created us to follow him in purity and rectitude. Those are the things that we were created to do and we were created to be. And in this specific parable, going back to Matthew 13, 44, what we see here is, believe it or not, a picture of the gospel. And I want to break down exactly what that picture is. Okay? It says in, I'll read it again, again, That was the verse, not me. 
<laughs> the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. You know, last week we noted how the gospel leaven, remember we talked about how leaven leaveneth the whole lump, and how we, the kingdom of God, are called leaven because we are called to infect, literally, the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're called to share so that it can move from person to person, and hopefully we can see souls saved. But I want to talk about today something a little differently. You know, we're going to talk about the ones who receive the gospel message. So I, start, I started when I was preparing this sermon to ask a couple of questions, and I want to go through those questions, okay, to unlock the meaning of this parable. Number one, what is the field? This one's pretty easy. The field is the world. In this parable, the field is the world. And here's the amazing thing. Remember, God made man and gave man dominion over all of the earth. I'll read Genesis 1.26. Again, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. But here's the thing. That dominion that we had was given to us with God's blessing. Adam enjoyed that dominion because he was in the will of God. And we, because we were made pure, had no need for salvation. Adam was made pure. He hadn't sinned until Genesis chapter 3, right? But when the fall occurred in Genesis chapter 3, two things happened. Number one, we gave away our dominion. Do you understand that? When we fell, one of the things that God said to Adam was... Now, the work that you're going to do is going to be hard for you. Before, the work was going to be easy. But now it's going to be hard because of the sin that you have done. We lost complete control that God had given to us because of our fall and our going after what we should not have gone after. You know, Satan, through sin, took possession of the hearts of men and Satan took his possession. This is the key thing. Satan did not purchase his possession over us. He took it. Unlawfully took it. And we handed it to him. Not only that, but we gave away our sinlessness by stepping out of God's will. And now owed an unpayable debt to God because of our turning away from him. We can never pay back the debt that we have. So, let's switch gears. Who is the man in the parable? Because it says in Matthew 13, 44, <clears throat> Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasure hidden in a field, which when a man found, he hideth. Okay? So, who is the man? Well, in short, Jesus is the man in the parable. You know, in John 3, 16, the verse that... Even lost people can quote up and down. It says, for God so loved the world. Did you catch that? Not just the select few. Not just the elect, as some people like to think. God loved the <coughs> world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But we cannot kid ourselves because we know that we're dealing with an omnipotent, omniscient God. He knew exactly who was going to be saved. He knows. He knows whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Right. And for the sake of us, he bought the entire field. For the sake of the treasure hid in the field, which are the people that receive him with gladness, he went and he said, you know what? No, 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 no. I'm going to go buy the entire field. <clears throat> and now, instead of being under the power of sin, all one has to do is receive Christ, and now we are no longer under the dominion of sin, but we are now called sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Sons and daughters of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. All that was possible because of what Jesus did, something we could never do. 
You know, he wishes that all of us would be saved. He really does. But he says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter ye at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. But, but because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. As we talked about yes, uh, last week, not yesterday, last week, a lot of people, a lot of churches that preach I, I, what I consider absolute garbage, because as long as you preach anything other than the gospel mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ, it is garbage and it is repulsive. Mm -hmm. They put a little bit of gospel in there and they have misled millions of people. A ton of churches that do that. They give you a little bit of a Bible because, you know, all lies have a little bit of truth in it. That's what Satan has been doing since Genesis chapter 3. A little bit of truth to cover up a whole lot of lie. But knowing that there would be those that would believe, he went into the world, died on the cross to purchase our debt that we owed to God himself. A debt that we could not pay, Jesus himself paid. The debt that was impossible for us to pay, he paid it for the treasure that was in the field, which is the ones that have received him as our personal Lord and Savior. For our sake, because he knew who was going to be saved, he knows who's going to be saved before all this is over. For our sake, he said, you know what? I'm taking the field back. Satan took it by malicious, unlawful, and just bad he did not do it the right way he did not purchase anything he stole it from the ones that he gave god gave possession of the earth to dominion of the earth to which was us he took it from us by causing us to go after sin and enslaving us in it and so jesus said okay i know you can't do it yourself so i'm gonna go and do it for you because i know you can't you know, those that would receive Christ, although the wish was and the wish has always been and always will be that all come to repentance. That's what it says in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. These were people that thought, you know, why is God taking so long? And we're still waiting for Jesus to come back. And some Christians out there might be, especially with what's going on in the world, why are you taking so long, God? Please come on, just come on now, come on. And they're living in absolute fear and absolute, just from a, a position of defeat instead of a position of victory. When God says, it's not that I'm, I forgot the promise I made to y'all. It's not that I just, you know, eh, I'll do it later. I have an appointed time that the promise is going to come forth. And until then, you got to get busy. Like Pastor said, there are two kinds of sermons. Get saved or get busy. And that's what we're called to do because of what God has done for us, because of what Jesus has done in giving us a way to be saved that we could not pay for ourselves. Our job is to go forth and give the gospel. Because we can. Because now a way has been made to be saved that we did not have before. A way has been made by faith, because by, without faith it is impossible to please God, right? Because of this faith that we have been given through the grace of Almighty God, we can now have a way to be saved, which was impossible unless Jesus himself stepped in, which he did. So who is the treasure in the field? Well, I kind of said it already, we are. We who receive God's word with gladness and receive Jesus as Savior, we who struggle with sin and don't simply live with it, we who are called to share the great message of the gospel that Jesus paid our unpayable debt in a supernatural transaction that occurred between him and the Father in which he gave himself for us on our behalf. The ones who would receive God's word with gladness. And here's the thing. And people sometimes miss this. I think this is one of the things that even C.S. Lewis, and I love his writing, and he, he did a lot of great work. Even he missed this when he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. Because if you notice, in the Chronicles of Narnia, I know it's an allegory, but stay with me. Aslan, who is a representative for Christ, pays the debt to the witch, who is the villain of the story. That's not entirely true. Because if the allegory was right, he should have paid the debt to the father not the witch. 
And he missed that because that was one of the things he had a little bit wrong in his theology. But I mean, you know, we're all imperfect. We're all learning. And he had that in there. But really what we have to understand when we look at the gospel, Jesus did not have to pay anything to Satan. Satan is a created being that is under Satan, that is under God, and he will have his day of justice on our behalf. And so God paid, or Jesus paid the debt to God, not to Satan. You know, Satan stepped in to usurp the authority that we were given by God and in turn subjugated us. You know, that word dominion, have dominion over all the beasts of the field, and fowl of the air, means to subjugate. Congratulations, that's exactly what, what happened to us when we committed sin, was we were subjugated, we were completely in bondage to sin because of what Satan did. But because Jesus stepped in, we're no longer under bondage, but we're free in Christ. You know, in this parable, we see the gospel revealed in that Jesus willingly laid down his position, his power, and his prestige to live among us so that he could buy the debt that we could never pay. That's what he did. He bought our debt. And try and many people try to, to live their life by good works trying to pay it back there it's impossible it's impossible and you'll be climbing that hill a million years and you'll still never get there so do what jesus says come unto me and i'll give you rest if you receive him i promise you there's you don't have to climb the hill that's impossible to climb because jesus already climbed it and he's on the other side waiting for us. Amen. For us, he climbed that hill. Amen. Literally, the hill of Calvary. For us. You know, in buying this debt, we are no longer bound to our deceiver, the prince of the power of the air. And I want to leave you with this. By the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, this wannabe ruler, Satan himself, understands that his days of deceiving are numbered, and that his judgment is at hand by the hand of the Son, who bought the whole field for our salvation. And that makes me happy. Yeah. Amen. And that should make all of us happy. In spite of everything going on in the world, that should be something that we can, every single day, rejoice because every single day it's true. There's not one day that passes if we're in Christ that that does not remain the truth in our lives. That God paid for us a debt that we could not pay. I know sometimes we look at other things and we kind of lose sight of what's important. But always go back to that. You can always be thankful for that. That Jesus paid something that we had no power, no capability, no way in heaven or earth to do. Which is pay the unmeasurable sin debt that we had before God. But praise God that he did. Let's pray.